So hello again and welcome to episode five of Who's Zooming Who? And joining me this uh, week is a very good friend of mine, Marie O'Neill from CCT College in Dublin. Myself and Marie first met uh, a little under a year now uh, ago now on the National Forum Pact uh, course where we were thrown together into a, a triad of two, would you believe? Um, but notwithstanding, <laughs> notwithstanding the fact that um, we were one leg short in our three-legged stool, uh, we still managed to get to the end. Uh, and we must have done something right because they asked us to come back and facilitate the course um, just before uh, the, start of, uh, the start of the year. But enough from me. I'll hand you over now to Marie, who'll do a far better job at introducing herself than I would. And perhaps, she'll, um, you, Marie, you could go through some of your career uh, to date and, and how you found yourself sitting here talking to me today. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Um, well, I started off in libraries, actually, um, and I'm actually from an arts background. And to be honest with you, I was never particularly interested in technology. I, I really sort of liked the books and... Well, I wouldn't have described myself as a techie person at all. And uh, when I left university, uh, suddenly I had to get a job and I decided to do a postgrad in librarianship and it was the early 90s. And I mean, this probably shows how old I am, Ken, but, and I don't know if you remember this, but I remember when we had print indexes, uh, you went into the library, uh, there was no fancy library catalogue or databases and there were big thick indexes and card, card indexes as well, card catalogues. Um, and uh, so really it was by working in libraries and studying about uh, libraries on the library course in UCD, the postgrad there. Um, and I also went on and did a postgrad in Northumbria as well, um, a master's there in librarianship in, in Northumbria University that I, I just suddenly really got plugged into the tech end of things. And it's really funny because libraries and librarians, sometimes the stereotype of sort of, you know, uh, that it's very bookish, but but librarians, you know, have been at the forefront of, of so many technological advances in higher education um, that perhaps we even take for, for granted today. Um, uh, you know, and, and I, I feel kind of blessed that I kind of saw that transition. I, I started working in King's Inns, then I went to TU Dublin. I was in UCD. Um, when I graduated um, in the early 90s, the, the unemployment rate was quite high then, Ken, and there was a lot of um, contract work. And, and it was actually fantastic, you know, that they, they take somebody for two years on a contract, then you go somewhere else. Um, and in a way, it was a blessing because I got to work in these amazing institutions, UCD, TU Dublin, King's Inns. Um, I went over to the UK for a while. I was in the Welsh office, came back, worked in the library of the Oireachtas. Um, I, I was also in Dublin Business School. I'm in CCT now. Um, so, yeah, just such a huge range of um, libraries. And, and tech it was a common theme throughout. Uh, they, they took these sort of card catalogues, these manual indexes, state-of-the-art databases. We now have um, incredible library, online library catalogues, live chat. Um, librarians are developing um, institutional repositories with all kinds of sophisticated schemes for, you know, metadata for, for so that, you know, uh, people can actually retrieve uh, the items that they're looking for easily. So discoverability is a big yeah. thing. And that was very powerful that we had all this tech, but the librarian also has their, their eye on people being able to discover um, sure. items as well. And that's built into it. So, yeah, so that, that was, um, you know, a really great experience. And, and I guess that's how that kind of led me into sort of crossing into other areas like teaching and learning. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I suppose one of the things that um, I would have noticed, I think I mentioned this last, last in one of the previous episodes as well, um, is um, the digital impact on libraries are completely different to what they were 20, 30, um, and certainly yeah. uh, longer ago. So you're working in CCT College now. Um, yes. And your role there is um, head of enhancement. Um, and obviously yes. digital plays a big part in that. So maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about CCT College and uh, and about your role in uh, in CCT. Yeah, um, well, it kind of really started with the senior management team there. I, they've got some really great people on the senior management team. There's obviously the president, Neil Gallagher, and um, he's just sort of full of passion and drive and he loves tech. And then we have Graham Glanville, who's our dean of school. He's also on the executive leadership team. And 
Um, he loves tech as well, and he's just done a PhD in the University of Hertfordshire on, on student self-efficacy. And I think tech, you know, and student self-efficacy are, are very much linked. You know, these tools really can help students to be more autonomous, to find their own voice, um, and so forth. Um, and then we have Carl Gallagher, um, who's our, our Dean of Finance and Admin, and he does a lot around the IT space as well. And then we have Naomi Jackson. They're the, they're the four people on the senior executive team. And Naomi loves tech tools. And she, I mean, she's just loved also the whole move online recently. Neil and Carl are the same. They've just purchased Zoom for education. And so, um, yeah, they, they've just are always kind of very innovative. They love the tech piece. And then they decided to create this role head of enhancement. And the role was designed to kind of look at all the different areas in the college, you know, teaching and learning, research, library, careers, and how can we en enhance those areas, you know, and, and tech plays a big part of that. But they've even come up with different roles, like um, we have a student success lead, uh, Greg South as well. Um, and there's some great people who are who are really into tech as well in the college, like Brendan McCown, who who's also studying cybersecurity as well, um, and and uh, he's been fantastic in, in in terms of supporting me as well, Carl and Nina as well, in, in things that I've wanted to do. But basically, in relation to the tech piece, we we brought in a certificate in teaching and learning for our staff, and we integrated a national forum digital badge on um, teaching strategies for new lecturers, and. Um, so tech has really been a big part of that certificate in teaching and learning. Um, there was already a big appetite for tech in the college before I even arrived, but we really sort of um, embedded that in the certificate in teaching and learning. So we had Dara Cassidy, head of online learning, come in and did a guest talk for us. Um, she did about the ABC curriculum and designing, you know, online programs. Um, we've had Geraldine Gray of TU Dublin come in and talk about the Dalty Project, which is a national forum funded project about learning analytics. Uh, Orna Farrell came in and did a talk on um, e-portfolios. The tech end of the certificate has been really, really huge. And um, But we also started a, an Excellence in Teaching series, and we've had Dara Casti spoke to us on that about um, Moodle, using H5P, Progress Tracker, really kind of getting more out of our Moodle installation. And, and we were already you know, good on Moodle. We were very good on Moodle before, before we went there. But just some of these other bells and whistles um, we had Kevin O'Rourke came in and talked to us about, um, you know, fake news and he's the digital campus architect in TU Dublin. Uh, these would all be great interviewees as well, by the way, Ken. And um, we've had Michael Hallisey. I, I, I'm Martin. writing them down here as we speak. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, so we, we had yourself as part of the you did, you did. series, which was fantastic. Thank you. You talked about I'm not, that. I'm not sure. I'm still not sure why, but you did. You did have me there. Um, <laughs> You were you were on our, our uh, wish list. Absolutely. No, uh, it must have been a slow news day or, or something like that. <laughs> Not at all. And you got everybody really fired up. So, um, and do you know what's really funny? I think because um, the senior executive leadership team and there's other champions of tech, uh, another guy in the college, Emil Caraponte, who works in our college, is, is, is really passionate about tech. And I just think that we, we already had that foundation. And then because we had the Excellence in Teaching series, and we also embedded this in the Certificate in Teaching and Learning, when this COVID thing took hold, it actually wasn't a traumatic transition for us. It's gone really smoothly. So I guess, you know, professional development, continual professional development just always pays off, you sure. know, it really does. It makes Ab you agile and yeah, responsive. I, 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 you know? I, absolutely. And I think a large part of it, um, yeah. And I'm certainly hearing this not just from from yourself just now in, in in the words you just spoke, but across the sector and from lots of people I'm speaking is that okay, you know nobody's pretending that what's happening right now. I mean, it's obviously it's a very serious situation, and and that that's the first thing to bear in mind uh, in, in terms of public health. But in terms of online teaching, you know nobody's pretending it's perfect, but yes, it, it's amazing how resilient. Um, lecturing staff have proven to be in adopting the tools that you know they, they might have been had a had a, a casual knowledge of and now suddenly are having to become far more familiar with um but it it's it's surprising what you can do i, I guess when you when you have to um, well, i have to say i totally agree with you on that ken yeah. and in the gas to go global event which i've actually watched twice which you believe <laughs> i watched it live and went back and watched it again i enjoyed it so much um that term digital resilience came up 
and um, that kind of really struck a chord with me. I think the Irish higher education sector has shown a lot of digital resilience, yes. you know, far more than maybe they, they felt they might have had in them, I think, you know. Um, I mean, I guess if you look across the sector, there's been lots of different enhancement projects going on digitally, and I think that probably stood us in much better stead than, than we may have anticipated, you know? Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I keep coming back to you, you know, when you, when you have to do something... It, yeah. it puts a whole different slant on oh, um, than yeah. wanting to do something. Um, exactly. And, and even the whole wanting to, you'll always find other things to get in the way. Um, yes. But suddenly when you, when, when you just have to do something, um, you just got to do it. Um, exactly. And, you know, the, the thing is, it mightn't be perfect, um, but the nice thing about something not being perfect is you can improve on it. Um, and I suppose that one of the pieces of advice I remember hearing like that is that, um, and, and this was to do with, 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 with uh, writing as opposed to anything else, was that you can't edit a blank page. Um, yes, but, exactly. You know, um, exactly. When, when you've started right. something and you've got words on, on, on a piece of paper, it's easy to make those better. Um, exactly. But if there's Absolutely. nothing there, um, it's, it's, it, it's not there. Any, any of you who are listening or watching um, our podcast and who took part in the packed course um, that myself and Marie facilitated will be well used to the fact that Marie, um, if nothing else, was thoroughly prepared each week. I probably <laughs> used to wing it um, and just turn up and turn You're the computer on and, 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 and hope that everything worked okay. Uh, whereas Marie... Um, Marie was very diligent in preparing slides, uh, so much so that she's actually prepared some slides for, for our chat today. I did. I did. Um, so I, I, I'm going to load those up now and, and share them with you. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the content there. For those you're, of you that you're are... Great, you're getting great value for, for money today. I've, absolutely. I've content yeah. and slides. I am yes. a librarian after all. The, the, uh, yeah. Oh, it was a great experience, the pact, um, Ken. And I learned so much from you on the ed tech side of things. It was just an invaluable experience for me. Um, and I think that's a great thing. Sometimes by teaching, you learn as much sometimes as the students are also learning. You know, you're, you're teaching them, but you're also learning from your peers. And it was great, great experience. Yeah, I think I think I saw a quote once, and I'm probably going to mangle this and, and get it wrong. But it was um, when when you teach, um, you learn twice, um, or yes. words words to that words to that effect. It is so true. And actually, Ken, yesterday I was listening to um, one of the Eden webinars. You know, the European Distance and E-Learning um, Network, and um, Alan Tate was saying, you know, about. Uh, there's sometimes the assumption that the on-campus on face-to-face is better than the online, you know. And I have to say, when I taught the pact, I, I couldn't believe what a kind of really rich teaching and, and learning experience it was, you know, how well we all got to know each other, the dialogue between us, the students, that, you know, when, it's, it, when, when you plan it and you do it right, I think online can be so rich, you know. A absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I, I do think it's is a you, you touched planning is probably the the, yeah. the 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 key part of it there in that um if you just think you can there's certain things you take for granted i, I guess in a in a face-to-face -face environment that you have to be more deliberate about and i've mentioned this um a number of times before um whereas it, it, when you're doing something online you do need to um perhaps think about it a, a little bit more. Exactly. Um, I, and, you're, and you're being very modest there now, because I think we were very good for sort of always planning our Mentimeters and our Padlets. And these apps are actually really helpful. They do really kind of get the engagement going, you know, and we always planned our discussions. And you know, so, yeah, the planning is, I totally agree with you, planning is everything. You might tell me what... Um, what it is you wanted to talk about on each of them sorry i'm trying to um, i'm gone i'm gone too, too too ahead there so the the, yeah, the, well, the title of this was your six favorite higher yes. ed developments brilliant yes the reason i wanted to talk about that ken is i just find the digital space in the higher education sector there's so much going on and it's just there's some really dynamic stuff going on so when you when you said about you know doing the interview i instantly thought can i talk about some of my favorite things that are going on at the moment or have been going on as well so thanks for that opportunity but 
something that I wanted to talk about were just, as I said, the six things. And one of them, this is a document that I think has been really seminal for me because I was working away in the library space. I hadn't really thought about crossing over into kind of teaching and learning or ed tech or anything like that. And this report came out from the National Forum and it was the roadmap um, for Digital World 2015, 2017. And I have to say, I love a lot of the imagery that the forum uses on a lot of their reports. I, lo I love the image of the kind of, you know, Ireland and the network and, you know, the sign building digital um, capacity. And it's just a very positive image. But I felt this document was seminal, Ken, because um, it was the first time, if you see under collaboration at the top and, and changing practice, they talked about actively engaging with students. It's the first time I, I, I started to hear people talk about student partnership. And I think that's so important in the digital space, the, the student input. And the other thing as well is this whole collaborative piece came through so strongly. Um, you know, the, it, it, it says, like the word librarian is mentioned six times in the document. I remember when it came out, I actually counted how nerdy is that. But the reason I was kind of excited about that <clears throat> is we didn't tend to get mentioned as a profession yeah. in these, in these and, and, and oftentimes in higher education students, we were one of the largest users of digital project, products in an higher education institution between ebooks, databases, library catalogs, you, you name it, you know institutional repositories, journal publishing software. Um, and I loved that it says the role of the academic support staff, librarians, centers for teaching, learning, IT staff, educational technologists, learner support staff, about us all being in this kind of vision for what the digital landscape could look like. And I just really loved that. And I thought it was a very radical document at the time. And again, you can see below there were mentioned as well about, you know, that uh, college you know the management of colleges that they actually develop through the lens they use the word the lens of all stakeholders it specialists students academics and administrative staff librarians and i just thought that was very powerful and that was one of the developments that i wanted to mention today and there's so much good work come on the back of that document in relation to the digital landscape in ireland and, and we they also started using words like evidence you know being more evidence-based sure. and um you know, having strong digital strategies. I think back in the day, they were probably a little bit more siloed. You know, the IT department was doing one thing, the library was doing another thing, and maybe the Centre for Teaching and Learning. And, and I just love their vision of it being kind of cohesive and yeah. all the key players involved. I just thought that was a really fantastic document. So I, I wanted to give that a shout out today. Very good. So that, that's, that's number one on your, that's on your, on your list. <laughs> Only five more to go, Ken. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And actually, we're kind of, I've been a bit sneaky. We're still on number one. I, I just kind of wanted to, anybody who is interested in the digital sort of landscape within higher ed that maybe doesn't know a huge amount about it yet, um, there's been a huge uh, body of work by the forum. It's all on the forum website, and some fantastic reports have been published since then. Um, you know, um, for example, on enabling policies in relation to digital, for example, and, and so forth. But there are these wonderful insights that the forum produce. And um, there's three that I think are really fantastic. One is on building digital capacity, and it gives a summary of everything the forum has done in relation to the digital landscape in Ireland, every key report. So it's a great starting point, that summary. It's two pages. It even has examples of funded projects, that uh, digital funded projects that the forum have been doing. So. In other words, if you wanted to reach out to another institution, start a conversation, um, and it's just a two page document and you could kind of jump in from there to various other reports. And then I love this towards the national understanding of student success. They published a report, at the National Forum on the understanding of student success. And if you actually look through it, um, it talks about learning analytics and, you know, digital assessment. There's quite a strong digital component. And I, I love that you know, that the digital, it, it does link into student success. It is empowering for students. And, and there's the developing learning analytics um, um, one as well. Lee, Lee, that was at the National Forum, has done a lot of work in that space and, and, and so forth. Um, and the learning analytics ties in with the digital. And I, I kind of love this shift that's happening with the digital um, from being kind of almost like a service thing to now really kind of being a tool to empower students sure. you know and and i think that's a really interesting shift and of course we've now had the index survey and that's being launched on may 7th which will give us a really good picture of what's happening across ireland yeah you know? I'm, I'm 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 looking forward to it um and, and there should be some some great insights into it yes so you touched on digital and um 
your number two in your in your top six was about digital transformation, yeah. which I'm guessing yeah. is, is is going to be some some more um, of the same. Um, I guess my my take on the digital thing is that there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. In that it, it's it's out there now, and you yes. know, um, you touched briefly in, in in libraries, and yes, I absolutely remember going to to libraries and the big index cards that you pulled out and and uh, <laughs> and trying trying to find books, you know. You, you couldn't imagine going back to that now once you've used uh, an electronic uh, database to, to, oh. to search for stuff. And, and oh that's God. kind of some, some of the same way I feel about the whole digital transformation. Um, yes. That, you know, in, in some areas we're already living in, in what could be probably termed a post-digital world, that digital is part of everything that we do. And, and there is no um, there is no going back. Um, so perhaps maybe you'd like to talk a little bit uh, about the, the digital transformation uh, materials that you, you've highlighted yeah. here. And that's actually a great point, Ken, that you mentioned, because in relation to the work of the National Forum in Relation to Professional Development Framework, they had actually wondered, should they have a digital domain at all? Should it just infiltrate all the domains? That in a way, you know, digital is everywhere now. But I do kind of like the focus on it still. I think it's always kind of good to focus on it. But this, I just love this concept of digital transformation. Basically, it's where you just have this cohesive strategy within an institution. All the key departments are involved. It's really about people. All the people are around the table, all the various users of, of digital technology. And um, there's a strong vision um, for digital transformation. But the other aspect of digital transformation is that it, it, it's also student centric and it's, it's about using your technology to, to sort of meet your strategic goals around what you want to do with, with students. And so there is a focus on, you know, learning analytics as well and uh, security, privacy. But you can see the word there on the infographic on the right, digital integrations, you know, of, of I remember when I started out and when we had technology within academic institutions first, it was like lots of separate robots in a room, but none of them actually talking to each other. So I love that word interoperability. I, I just think the more the systems work together, the more seamless the experiences for the student. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, so I, I love this. And Educase is doing great uh, stuff in this space. Um, and uh, that's a really good document. They have their seven things you should know about digital transformation. I have all the references in the back. And that's a great infographic, simplify, sustain, innovate. And just again, working together. It's really about having you know, all the people around the table and all the people working together. And um, I, I just think there's lots more to come in this space. And I, 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 think I, and I probably should just make the point there that the, I'll, I'll put a copy of Marie's presentation here. Uh, in the show notes um, on the podcast, and they'll also be available um, underneath the uh, the YouTube video. So, brilliant! Thanks, uh, Ken. For, for for those that are are listening, I'm wondering what it is we're talking about, but um, <laughs> it's it's definitely worth it's definitely worth um, checking out. Thank you. So your your number three was user experience, um, and I guess that yes. that ties in nicely to uh, as you finished up there talking about um, putting the student at the center of it all. Um, yes, and I think. You know, as much of a technologist as I am, and, and you know me as a as a techie as much as anything else, <laughs> um, it's it's never tech for the sake of tech. In that, you know, there has to be a, a reason for all this. You know, there has to be a reason yes. why you use these tools. There has to be. It's not just let's use this because it's shiny and new and it has uh, flashing lights or or whatever else. Um, it has to be that it supports. Um, a learning objective or it makes things easier or it makes things more enjoyable or there, you know, there has to be some um, reason um, why, why you're doing it. So perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the user experience or student voice that you have outlined there. Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about the user experience. And um, I was reading a book about business libraries one time um, when I was back in my, my library space back in the day. And uh, this guy called Andy Priestner, he's a librarian in the Judge Business School in Cambridge University. Um, he's now gone out actually as a consultant in this whole space. He had written a chapter about, you know, um, with referencing user experience. And, uh, and I, I looked into it a little bit more and actually invited him to come over and talk at one of our um, seminars, a library seminar that I used to run and he kindly came over and it was basically just about we think we know how students interact with physical space and how they interact with the digital world but actually we, we might as well tear all our assumptions up because they started doing things like um, rather than using the traditional survey all the time with students they started doing things like observation 
So a member of the library team would just observe how students interacted with te technologies or different spaces within the library, physical space as well. Um, and um, they'd also do things like impromptu interviews with, you know, just a handheld recorder as, as students were coming in. And what they discovered when they started mapping how students behave with the physical space, the digital space, it was completely different to what we, we assumed. And so I just thought that was really interesting. And, and he did a lot around restructuring library services, library resources in light of that feedback that he got. And, um, and I think sometimes this is maybe an underused kind of tool. Um, and I came across an article, the UX gap in higher education um, and other articles that says, you know, user experience is absolutely critical. And I think if we are going to talk about student partnership and the student voice, then I think the user experience really gives students a chance to, to kind of feed back on how they really truly interact with things and what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, and I think we can't have digital transformation. This was another piece that I found. Why user experience is the centerpiece of digital transformation. This was another article I found. I don't think you can really truly have digital transformation without understanding how, how students interact with digital products. Because we could have everything, all our ducks lined up in a row, we've all sat around the table, we've designed all these systems. But if we think we know what the students want and we think we know how they interact with these sure. technologies, then it's, it's a waste of time. And so I actually went back, the National Forum has a new strategic plan out and I kind of thought, I wonder are they looking at this? Because they, they always kind of, you know, are very kind of, in tune, I guess, with what's happening research-wise in, in the higher education space. And I went back and I actually found that one of their objectives in their new strategic plan is enhance the understanding. They want to enhance understanding of how staff and students are currently engaging with digital technologies, as well as their needs and concerns. And that's basically user experience. So it was right in there as yeah. one of their kind of core priorities. And um, But this is a really nice report. I don't know, do you know this report, Ken, the Horizon Report? I've heard of the Horizon Reports, I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they do one for libraries and they do one for um, teaching and learning. And this is the 2021. And it always gives you kind of the, the next five big trends um, that are coming up. And in it, it talks about the elevation of instructional design, learning engineering and UX design. They see that as being core. And I saw something you shared on Twitter, Ken. You always share great stuff on Twitter about uh, instructional designers. Yes, so we're saying it's like the hottest yeah. job in, in, in higher ed. The hottest job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, prob I'm probably slightly biased because before my current role, my title was instructional designer. So, um. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're bang on the money there because uh, that came through in the Horizon report that this whole space of UX, instructional design, and, and I think, and you know, I, I actually, I love, do you know what's really exciting about the digital landscape now is we, you know, when I started out, we were using a lot of digital products and I, we didn't have a national student engagement program or anything sure. like that. I think having that program and, and bringing that into the digital space, you know, the likes of Oshin and the team there, Jeremy, all of them there, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, there's exciting possibilities there too, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that uh, was my, my number three. Absolutely. That I so, love. And, and number four, which I, which I guess again is, is student focused in terms of um, you're talking about student literacies. Uh, and I noticed that digital literacy um, is is one of the ones you have mentioned there in the in the diagram. Um, so maybe you'd like to talk a, a little bit uh, a little bit around that as well. Yeah, well, basically, um, in 2015, the National Forum did, and there was the input of some um, very high level librarians and very experienced librarians into this document because we often notice the digital skill gap or the information literacy gap sometimes earlier than many other staff in the higher education because they come into the library and we can tell that they don't know what a good information source is they can't tell fake news apart from information you know from correct news sure. maybe they're not able to use the library database so i i think librarians tend to do a lot of instruction around literacies because we, we probably see it a little bit more you know early on if you like and they've come up um you know, with uh, some, some digital skills in that document towards the National Digital Skills Framework, it's by the, by the forum. And there's great stuff in there and there's the All Aboard program and you can go and actually test your mm -hmm. own digital literacy as a staff member as well, um, or as a student or whatever, and, it, and it's really great. And they actually refer in that document to this one in the middle that I have here called Meta Literacy. Um, Mackie and Jacobson um, produced this. And Meta Literacy 
is where you know you are comfortable using online resources but you're also comfortable using mobile resources you're also comfortable using social media you can also use open educational resources and you can see on the outer circle and the listeners will be able to see it when they when they see the slides back that the other criteria for this type of literacy is that you're able to use incorporate produce and share do you know it's not just enough to be digitally literate but it, it's also important to be able to be part of online communities to be able to share critique sure. Um, and then I found this other chart, which again, the, the, the listeners can see when they, when they see the slides, and um, it talks about literacies in the digital age. And um, unfortunately, I tired eyes on me. I couldn't find the source. I went back to find the source where I'd got it. It pops up in a lot of library association bodies. And um, they talk about, um, you know, we're, we're still talking about digital literacy, but they're talking about data literacy. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about visual literacy. I know you had Susan Sweeney down in uh, WIT recently, um, a former colleague of mine, she's done a lot of work about visual literacy. I mean, I have to admit, Ken, I am probably one of the most visually illiterate people. We, we learned so little about visual literacy, what to do with images, how to use them, you know, legally, how to manipulate images. And we live in such a visual world. I mean, if you're a business graduate and you go into the business environment, it's all about imagery. It's all about, you know, um, so it's got all these things, media literacy. So that's so important in this age of fake news. Um, and I really love that. And something that I think could be very interesting in this space and it is something like maybe a national symposium on sure. literacy. And let's well, all compare I, notes on it, you know. Yeah, and what I, I, I know Doug, Doug Belshaw has done a lot of work in that area as well, or Dr. Doug Belshaw, to give me his proper title, um, hmm. has a very good publication, The Essential Elements of Digital Literacies. Um, Brilliant, I'll that, check that, that out. That, that's well worth, worth checking out. So okay, moving, on, yeah. mo moving on to your next um, slide if I can get back here again um, this is one you actually sure shared I think just recently um, yes yeah that, that online course quality indicators and oh and my god Ken do you know I shared that yesterday and it's up to about a hundred likes on LinkedIn already um, it's just it literally went on fire the minute I put it on LinkedIn and uh, it's online course quality indicators and it's from the national Research Centre for Distance Education and Technological Advances at the University of Wisconsin. And I think maybe the reason it's been so popular when I shared it, and it's still sharing, I actually had to turn my phone off because it's beeping all the time, is I think there is a real appetite. Okay, we're, we're, we're doing all this online stuff, but how well are we doing it? Sure. And it's just such a great, neat kind of infographic. And it's based on a study I have in the, re the details in the reference and, um, you know, on the design, the organization, the support, the clarity. The instructor interaction, peer interaction, content interaction, richness of, of the online learning experience. Um, so it's um, it's a really good infographic, and again, it's in my re references for um, the listeners, um, and uh, it's definitely worth checking out. And another one that I really like, I really love the emphasis on sort of reflection as well. That's really happening in the digital space, and uh, the National um, Institute for Digital Learning um, at DCU. They, they published this report in 2009, Ona um, Farrell and um, Ona Farrell, sorry, James Brunton, um, Eamon Coslow, um, and others. And um, it, it's called Teaching Online is Different. And they reflect on, um, you know, approaches to teaching online and what works, what, what doesn't work, models, et cetera. Yeah. And, it's, and, on and it's on open access, so it's fantastic. It is, and, and I actually spoke about that that exact report. I've I've one of the treasured print versions of it um, <laughs> that that Orna was giving out at the the World Conference of Online Learning. Um, I'm jealous. And uh, we spoke about it when I when I spoke to Orna just 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 a, sh a few short weeks ago. Um, I have to say, I think there's a really great team out there um, in the National Institute for Digital Learning, and um, and led by Mark Brown. I really enjoyed Mark Brown on the Gaster Goes Global, and I think he's completely right. People think that you can throw any old thing up online. Sure. And he was totally right about that. And they're a very generous team as well. They're a very productive team. They're always publishing, but they share so much as well, Ken. They do. And they do. During this COVID, the whole hashtag open teach thing, I just think they really kind of came, you know, riding in uh, at a time when people really needed them, you know? Yeah. And they, have a, they have a fantastic page of resources that, that's still available for everybody um, to look at. That's just, it's growing by the, it's growing by, by the day almost or by the hour almost um, it's it's gone so long now. I, I i'm conscious of, of we're, we're 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 almost up on time but i do want to get to number six i've only got one more <laughs> before we run out 
and this is three open source digital tools that you, that yes. you love. So maybe you'll, 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 talk around, uh, you'll talk around some of those. Perfect. Well, I love open source, Ken. I absolutely love open source. And I, the reason I love open source is I just think it's a much more exciting project. You can buy something, um, you know, um, off the shelf, if you like. But when you use open source, you're actually interacting with another institution. So this was online reading list software that I put in to a library that I was working in and we put all the reading lists online. Um, and it's amazing to think you have a print reading list. A reading list is probably one of the most primary teaching and learning tools that there still is to this day. It, you know, it, it's, a, it's a source of comfort for students. It's where they find their support texts. Uh, they cling on to it, they come running into the library, and yet so many reading lists are still in print, print format. So we put all our reading lists online using Loughborough's online reading list system, which is open source software. There are proprietary versions as well, which are excellent, like Rebus and so forth. But it's just fantastic. It has a dashboard on it. And I took a screenshot and it actually shows you, you know, how many times your reading lists are read. It actually shows you the composition of a reading list if it's made up of e-journals, books. So if you found one that was just got books on it, as a librarian, you could reach out to that faculty staff member and say, you know, there's really great journals you can add into your reading sure. list. There's really good open educational resources. Um, and students could also interact with it. They can rate um, things that they like. It can also provide feedback on reading this items and it's just fantastic and this team in Loughborough they publish a lot on it and I actually me being me I asked Gary Bruton from Loughborough University to come over and speak at a, a seminar that I was running which he did and I actually went on to publish an article about implementing that software in the new review of academic librarianship and I did focus groups with faculty and they just absolutely loved it fantastic. Uh, they just thought it just was such a simple concept but very powerful for students and this one then on the right that I love is the assignment calculator. It was actually recommended by one of the team at DBS and, and we ran with it. And it's from the University of Minnesota and it's an assignment calculator and we put it on Moodle. And basically the student gets an assignment, they go to the calculator, they put the date that the assignment is due and the, cal the calculator will automatically email, they put their email address in, uh, supports to them. So they'll be saying at this stage you should be writing an introduction, it would look like this. If you are struggling, reach out to this person. Have you tried that database? such a simple tool but such Fantastic. a great way to push out content to students and also very inclusive because it's great for transitions for students trans yeah. transitioning in from secondary school it's great for students with learning difficulties so it's a really powerful tool and i'd, I'd highly recommend it and again it's open source um, as well and i've one more open source tool and then we're we're almost there ken thank you for bearing with me in my six favorite things this is called subjects plus there is a proprietary version called LibGuides, which I've used before and it's great, but the Subjects Plus is an open version and allows librarians to create web pages. And that's very important to us because we change content so much. We don't always want to be going through a central system. So we stick to the branding of the company, but we can create our own pages. And that, that's one of their pages in Miami. It's completely open source. Uh, Brendan McCown at CCT has been doing great help working with this. This is a, a guide I've created on group work for for students it has our cct group work policy you know lots of things about group works video content and that's just free open source software and it's very exciting last week myself and brandon and justin the librarian at cct we were on a call to the university of miami and the developers there and you just couldn't put a price on that kind of thing and that's why i just love i love open source and it's great for your budget as well um, now having said that we, we do spend a lot of money on digital projects as well we just got one um called digital commons and we use it to showcase our research. If anybody gets a chance to check it out, we've just started populating it. It's arc.cct.ie, and we're putting all our professional development and our research on it. Um, and we're one of four institutions that has digital commons now. Uh, CIT has it, TU Dublin, and one other place I can't remember, and ourselves. And um, so, but it's nice to have the balance, I think, of the proprietary and some open source as well. Sure, sure. And then I just have one closing slide that I, I wanted yeah. to make one final very important point. And ultimately, Ken, I think all this digital stuff in terms of students, I think that it's even bigger than education. It's about lifelong learning. And UNESCO is doing a huge amount in the digital literacy space. And um, if we have graduates, you know, or citizens that, that aren't digitally literate and they can't join online communities, well, then half the time they're just sort of socially excluded. The world is so virtual today. And I actually think that these skills, I mean, this sounds, you know, very grandiose in a way, but it makes the world a better place because people can participate. They can be global citizens. And if you look at a lot of the graduate attributes in higher education institutions now, including CCT, uh, 
that's what we want for our students is sure. for them to be able to travel, contribute, lifelong learning, to change society. And, and I just think this whole digital space is, is truly transformative in that sense. Yeah. No, and, and, and actually the, the, the last week's episode of the podcast, which you won't have seen yet, but you'll see tomorrow um, with Sharon Flynn. Oh, I'm looking to, forward to, to that. I love to, Sharon. Sharon from the IUA project. Um, She's doing amazing stuff. Is doing, is doing fantastic work. And two of the three pillars of that project um, are around um, the, the, the digital attributes of graduates um, and the digital experience of graduates. So it's, 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 it, it all ties in very, very nicely with, with all, of what you've been, uh, all of what you've been talking about. Oh, I love that. That's really kind of a space that I really like. And I've got the UN Sustainable Goals there, you know. And yeah. They're, they're amazing and I just think it ties in with all that and on the right there I actually have a snapshot from the professional development framework the national forums one that I've done a lot of work in and they've got in the digital domain of that framework they have a lot about that about you know uh, obviously upskilling ourselves in terms of you know being digitally literate to teach and all of that but it also talks about you know being able to empower students digital well-being and development and advancement there's a holistic element there as well and and that's why we need to keep up professional development in terms of the digital because ultimately empowers the students, you know, so in this respect. Brilliant. I, I'm going to stop sharing your slides again now and uh, we'll go Thank back to you. just, just, just the talking heads on, thanks, on screen. Thanks for giving me that opportunity. That's the kind of stuff. That no, I really love. Uh, absolutely. And um, it, it, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be me talking to Marie without slides there, <laughs> there, 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 there somewhere, I guess. Not the sliders. Uh, yeah, I am guilty the, of this. The, the, um, <laughs> Would you believe that we've been talking for over forty minutes? Um, oh gosh! So you, you you have the um the, the the new record for my longest podcast uh, as 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 well that as everybody else. Surprise me at all! Ta I get ta very excited. Yeah, time time definitely flies when when, when you're having fun. <laughs> um, and you, you've you've it's been true. absolutely fantastic, and I found it very interesting. Uh, if nothing else, as I mentioned already. The presentation, um, together with all the references, will be available on uh, the show notes for, for the podcast, and I'll, and I'll link that up um, in the um, YouTube video as well. All that remains for me to say is, Marie, you've been fantastic. Thank oh, you, thank you um, very, very much. It was great um, to, 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 to have you on the podcast. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, it, it wasn't as bad as you thought it might have been. So yeah. It was actually much better. You're a brilliant interviewer, which helps. I don't know if I am, no, I don't think I am. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just sit back and listen, um, but I, I'm interested in this. So uh, I guess it's, it's, it's easy yeah. enough to do. Ray, thanks, thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. All Bye -bye. the best. Thank you, Kent.